Greetings everybody, it's Jesse here and has the Antichrist been revealed? This is part two and in part two we are going to be looking at the phrase the son of perdition. This is going to be a very, this is going to be very deep. Okay, this is going to be a very deep little study here. Um, and this is also going to answer the question from where does this man of sin come out of does he come from outside the church out of Europe the UN or something along that does he come from the royal bloodlines or does he come from within Christianity itself does he come from within the body of Christ And when you find out the answer to this, then those that have a different set of a beliefs, when you look at the clear description of what the son of perdition is according to the Bible, you really are going to have to question, hopefully question yourself, as to why you believe in a certain way that this man has to come from outside of the church because the church is no longer here. Again, people read 2 Thessalonians chapter 2 and they just right away assume, okay, the coming and the gathering of the Lord Jesus Christ, they, they've, been, they've been taught a certain doctrine, a certain way of how they're going to be caught up. They've been taught this and they have had this been filtered in their minds for so long now that it's, it's, been, it's basically like a sponge and it has been soaked in and they refuse to just throw out everything aside and go by what Jeremiah 6.16 says, which is, Thus saith the Lord, standing in the ways, and see, and ask for the old paths, where is the good way, and walk therein, and ye shall find rest for your souls. But they said, But they said, We will not walk therein. Regardless of what's going on, Regardless of things that are happening that should have been happening when we have been, because we're, we're no longer here, is happening now. And this is going to happen. They said, no, we will not walk therein. We will not ask for the old paths because we're, you know, knowledge is increasing. Knowledge is increasing and, you know, what was believed in the in two three hundred years ago is not what we believe today because that was for that time but folks there is no gap in history there is no gap in the earth's existence of roughly six thousand years or so there is no gap it is a continuation from year zero from year one all the way up until today <clears throat> Okay, there is no gap. So we have to look at the old paths because it is the old paths where is the good way. It is the old paths from where knowledge will be increased because when we look at the truth of the knowledge that people had in the past regarding scripture because they held scripture with such a, with, with, so dearly and they were able to figure things out because their minds were cleared. They have come out of a system and they had things revealed to them and it was truth. But now that truth has been kin has been put out, so to speak. Truth is still truth no matter how old the truth is. We have to we have to understand that in order for knowledge to increase we have to go back to the basics we have to go back to the old paths and learn from that and then therefore from there knowledge will increase because right now there is a famine in the land it's not a famine for, of bread and water but it's a famine for the word of God and no one is there it's it's pretty bad so 
what we're going to do is we are going to look at the son of perdition and Judas Iscariot. We're going to be pinpointing the Antichrist's location. Where does he arise from? Where does he come from? Okay. Again, 2 Thessalonians 2, 1 through 3. Now we beseech you, brethren, by the coming of our Lord Jesus Christ and by our gathering together unto him, that ye be not soon shaken in mind, nor be troubled, neither by spirit, nor by word, nor by letter, as from us, as that the day of Christ is at hand. And we went over this, and we can look at this again. Let no man deceive you by any means, for that day shall not come, the coming together, the coming of our Lord Jesus Christ, the day of Christ, it's all the same thing. Except there come a falling away first, apostasy, and that man of sin be revealed. That's two, which is the son of perdition, or the Antichrist. After those two things have happened, then the next thing that happens in this order of events in Second Thessalonians 2, as Paul wrote it, is the coming of our Lord Jesus Christ and our gathering together unto him. Two things have to happen first. Falling away, man of sin be revealed. <clears throat> so let's go ahead and look at this phrase, the son of perdition. And it is very sobering. Many people will already know that there's only two times that the phrase son of perdition is used. One is in John 17 which is used to describe Judas Iscariot. And the other one is right here in 2 Thessalonians 2.3. Okay. But that's as far as they go. They won't go any farther than that. We're going to go a little farther. And when this is done, it's probably going to rock some of you to the core. You're going to have to ask yourself, does it really make sense for the church to be gone before Antichrist comes, when Antichrist comes from within the church itself? And we're going to look and see how close Judas was to Jesus Christ. John 17, 11 and 12. And now I am no more in the world, but these are in the world, and I come to thee. Holy Father, keep through thine own name those whom thou hast given me, that they may be one, as we are. While I was with them in the world, I kept them in thy name. Those that thou gavest me, I have kept. So those that thou gavest me, the Father, that had, those that thou, the Father, gavest me, I have kept. And none of them is lost but the son of perdition, that the scripture might be fulfilled. And that son of perdition was one of the twelve that the father gave unto the son. And obviously we know by further reading of the context that Judas Iscariot is that son of perdition. Because there's only one of the twelve that could have that label and they could have that title. And that is the, the betrayer. That is the one that betrayed him. Now let's backtrack a little bit earlier in Christ's ministry. Let's go ahead and look at Luke chapter 6. Okay. Why don't you pay attention here? We're going to read from verse 12 to 16. Luke 6, 12 to 16. And it came to pass in those days that he went out into a mountain to pray and continued all night in prayer to God. And when it was day, he called unto him his disciples, and of them... He chose twelve, whom also he named apostles. Simon, whom he also named Peter, 
and Andrew, his brother, James and John, Philip and Bartholomew, Matthew and Thomas, James, the son of Alphaeus, and Simon called Zelotes, and Judas, the brother of James, and Judas Iscariot, which also was the traitor. So, who was Judas? Judas was of the twelve, wasn't he? He was one of the twelve. He was one of the twelve. He was one of the inner echelon of the of this group of people. He was one of the twelve. He was one of the ones closest to Jesus Christ. Let's go on further. Matthew ten one through four. <clears throat> kind of repeats itself here, but there's something else added. <clears throat> Matthew ten one through four, starting in verse one. And when, he had, and when he had called unto him his twelve disciples, not eleven, Judas was not left out here. Bear in mind. So where is this son of perdition coming from? Is he coming from within Christianity or is he coming from without? And when he had called unto him his twelve disciples, he gave them power against unclean spirits to cast them out and to heal all manner of sickness and all manner of diseases. So here is Jesus. Jesus, through the power of God, gave his disciples, all 12 of them, Judas included, to cast out spirits, heal all manner of sickness, and all manner of diseases. So he was able to produce miracles, wasn't he? He was able to produce signs and wonders. Judas was healing people in the name of Jesus Christ, wasn't he? Yes, he was. And the son of perdition that Jesus links to Judas is our example of where the Antichrist that Paul mentions in 2 Thessalonians chapter 2. We have to go to Jesus and find out the example. And when we find out the example, then we're going to know where the son of perdition comes from. Where that man of sin is going to be seated. Or is seated. This is our example. Now the names of the twelve apostles are these. We're going to go over them again. The first, Simon, who was called Peter, and Andrew his brother, James, the son of Zebedee, and John his brother, Philip and Bartholomew, Thomas and Matthew, the publican, James, the son of Alphaeus, and Labias, whose surname was Taddeus, Simon the Canaanite, and Judas Iscariot, who also betrayed him. And then Luke 22, 1 through 3. This is where it gets a little, this, this is where it gets powerful here. Okay, this is where it gets really important. Now the feast of unleavened bread drew nigh, which is called the Passover. And the chief priests and scribes sought how they might kill him, for they feared the people. Pay attention. Then entered Satan into Judas, surnamed Iscariot, being of the number of the twelve. Of the number of the twelve. He was still of the twelve at that point, wasn't he? So what does that tell us? Satan can enter into people, can't he? Satan even has the ability to enter into those that profess the name of Christ. Can he? <clears throat> you skip down to verse 14 and when an hour was come he sat down and the twelve apostles with him the last supper the bread which symbolized the body that would be broken for us Judas took part of that 
the wine, which symbolized the blood which would be shed for the sins of the world. When they drank that wine, Judas took part of that. Can it be any more clear of where the son of perdition comes from? Can it be any more clear that this son of perdition comes from within the church? From within the body of Christ? So is the church still here when the son of perdition is revealed? Absolutely. Is the church raptured and then the son of perdition is revealed? Absolutely not. All we have to do is look at the examples. I don't care what anybody had, you know, I don't care what any fancy study they have done. This is just scripture here. All you have to do is compare line by line. And you're going to be able to see where this individual or where this group of individuals come from. Comes from within the church. So deceptive for that matter that he had the disciples. He had the disciples and the disciples believed Judas to be one of the twelve because Judas was that close to the son Judas was that close to Jesus Christ Matthew 26 47 through 50 and Psalms 141 9 <clears throat> and while he yet spake lo, Judas, one of the twelve, came, and with him a great multitude. Notice it's still saying one of the twelve. Came, and with him a great multitude, with swords and staves. Now here Satan has already entered Judas, okay? From the chief priests and elders of the people. Now he that betrayed him gave them a sign, saying, Whomsoever I shall kiss, that same as he hold him fast. Pay very close attention. And forthwith he came to Jesus and said, Hail, Master, and kissed him. Hail, Master. He said the right words. He said the true words. He acknowledged Jesus as Master. He acknowledged Jesus as the Son of God. Hail, Master. Okay. You have to bear this in mind. Okay. that This is how Jesus is acknowledging him. And he kissed him. Hail, Master. There are those within the church that will proclaim a, a, a very, very strong love for Jesus Christ. They, so they will sit there and say, hey, O Master. So obviously Judas knew who Jesus was, right? He knew who Jesus was. He knew who he was. But what was his heart? <clears throat> and Jesus said unto him, Friend, wherefore art thou come? That's powerful in and of itself. Here Jesus is acknowledging Judas as a friend friend this is the closeness of his disciples including Judas okay this is the closeness he has friend wherefore art thou come then came they and laid hands on Jesus and took him Psalm 41 9 yea mine own familiar friend in whom I trusted which did eat of my bread hath lifted up his heel against me And in Zechariah 13, 6, And one shall say unto him, What are these wounds in thine hands? Then he shall answer, Those with which I was wounded in the house of my friends. The son of perdition 
the Antichrist. Is going to come from within the church. A church that is pure. That is so pure. And a church that is strong rooted in the scriptures. This is where he's going to come from. He's going to seem like he's so close to the sun. So close to Jesus Christ. But yet, people are looking for an antichrist that's going to come from without the church because they don't acknowledge the fact that the church is still going to be here when he is revealed. And I'll tell you something, he's already been revealed. He's been revealed a long time ago. A long time ago. But they won't acknowledge it. They won't go back and ask for the old paths. They won't go back and ask for the old paths wherein is the good way. And so that is why many of those out there making videos, presentations, that are outside this truth are deceived. Because again, you cannot have the revealing of the Antichrist with the church gone. The church must be here. We're almost done here. Perdition, obviously, comes from the word apalia, which can uh, also be related to apalion. Perdition means destruction, ruin or loss, physical, spiritual, or eternal damnable or damnation destruction die perdition perish pernicious ways waste okay revelation 9 11 and they had a king over them which is the angel of the bottomless pit whose name in the hebrew tongue is abaddon but in the greek tongue hath his name apollyon and apollyon look at the connection of the words here means destroyer that is satan This Antichrist is called the son of perdition, the son of destruction, the son of the destroyer, the child of Satan. Judas was called the son of perdition, the son of destruction, the son of the, the, of the, the, son of the destroyer, sorry, a child of Satan. You are of your father the devil, and of his works you will do. Sure, there are many children of the devil from within the church. But there is one that has a seat, that has a seat of authority, that has a seat of power, that has a seat to give out order and legislation And that's the one we have to pinpoint. And by, by far, my friends, I believe we have pinpointed it. So, again, let's read this one more time. Now we beseech you, brethren, by the coming of the Lord Jesus Christ and by our gathering together unto him, that ye be not soon shaken in mind, or be troubled neither by spirit, nor by word, nor by letter, as from us, as that the day of Christ is at hand. Let no man deceive you by any means, for that day, the day of Christ... The coming of our Lord Jesus Christ, the gathering together unto him, shall not come, except there come a falling away first. Number one, that man of sin be revealed. Number two, the son of perdition. That man of sin is the son of perdition. Who opposeth and exalteth himself above all that is called God or that is worshipped, so that he as God sitteth in the temple of God, showing himself that he is God. In the next video, we are going to be looking at the acts of worship. What is considered an act of worship? And what does it mean to be sitting in the temple of God? What is the temple of God?
that is what we have coming in the next video. Until then, I hope this has helped you and blessed you. And I hope this kind of this kind of made some hair stand on end. If you're angry, be angry. I'm glad I made you angry. <laughs> Cause maybe that seed might be planted. Until next time, truth be told, truth be known, stay safe. God bless. Stick to the scriptures. We'll see you next time. Bye-bye.